I want to thank you all, of course, for being here. All right, with that, I'd like to uh, invite the Honor Guard, Framingham Police Honor Guard, on the direction of Lieutenant Riley. Uh, please present the colors. Please stand. I now ask our national anthem to be sung by Lonnie Powell. <clears throat> oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous strife or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the Now, if you please remain standing and like to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The honor of God is dismissed. And now our invocation will be delivered by Rabbi Sharon Sobel of Temple Beth Am. Oh God, the power to make a difference inspired by our young people whom we are here to celebrate and honor this morning, the power to make change the power to either lift up or to denigrate, to sanctify or to desecrate, to perpetuate, to change the fate of our community and our world by our actions, by our words and deeds. We all have power, but this power is fragile. It is limited by the vagaries of the human condition, and it is also illusory. For everything we do is relative to our situation and our ability to perceive the world around us. On this beautiful morning, let us think about other kinds of power, the power that is bestowed by our ability to perceive the miracles that surround us, the rising of the sun, the winds that bring desperately needed rain and snow, the beauty of the budding fl flowers, the blossoming trees, we think of the power of the laughter of small children, and this power is tempered by the power of the desperate cries of fathers and mothers who cannot feed them, and the power of the emptiness in the eyes of the downtrodden, the optimism of those who work to bring hope to the hopeless, the warmth of hands who bring friendship to the lonely, and the love of hearts that can turn stone-cold hatred into harmony and peace. All of these and more are driven by the great power that comes from either a vision of hope, driven by our understanding that every human being 
is made B'Tselem Elohim, Hebrew, for being created in the image of God. Eternal Creator, be with us this day. Help us to see the wonders of your creation. Keep us humble and aware of our debt to you for the very air we breathe and the dance of life you grant to us and for the music we feel with every breath. Inspire us to use our power to work together to make truth, righteousness, justice, and peace a lasting reality in our world. And let our beautiful youth leaders whom we honor this morning continue to use their power to lead us to a better tomorrow for all who live in this, on this earth. As it is written in the biblical book of Micah, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, here we are again. 27 years, and I don't feel a day older, despite maybe some of the looks. But uh, I have to tell you, as somebody didn't make reference to my tie. Notice I didn't make reference to it. They said, what a nice tie. And it proved to me once more that really, you can wear the same tie two years. <laughs> and, and I said to myself, they like it. And it's a Garcia tie, kids, just in case you wanted to know. And if you need to know who Garcia is, oh, brother. All right? Uh, so anyway, but the tie is there. And I decided to bring it out of dry dock. And uh, two years ago, I wore a tuxedo, so that made it all right. But this year, a little different, 27 years. It's been a wonderful journey. I want to thank everybody who has sponsored this, this meeting, as you know, and they are, all their names are listed on the back of the program book. And uh, I appreciate the fact that these sponsors are the ones who generally donate a table so that we can have each of the schools represented here at the, uh, at the breakfast. Uh, 15 schools are going to be honored today, the students from those schools for the work that they've done. Most of you know you've been here before. I want to first say thank you to the committee, the steering committee. If the members of the steering committee would just stand up to be recognized, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Some, of course, cannot be here. They are working today uh, and uh, not able to be here. But one of the people that has been on our committee for a long time and is no longer going to be able to serve, she's moving into, she's moved to uh, up by Ipswich, I believe. And, uh, but she's the one that helped prepare the, the fine slideshow that you saw while you were coming in today with pictures that the students submitted and planned that little, uh, that little video. So we thank them. We also want to say thanks. There, there are a couple of special people that are here today. Uh, we don't usually honor dignitaries, uh, all due respect to the political arena. But uh, today, we've been asked to rep acknowledge, at least, uh, State Representative David Linsky, if he would stand. I, I, I thought he was here. <laughs> I couldn't see him. Uh, oh, OK, there you are. <laughs> Thank you. And also Susan Nicole from the Senate President, uh, Senate President Karen Spilka's office. Thank you, Susan. And of course, I could be out of a lot of jobs if I don't recognize this person because though it's her second year in office, uh, last year she was invited, this year invited again. And on behalf of the city of Framingham, I'd like to ask Mayor Spicer if she would like to... Mayor, would you like to say a few words this time? I know unbecoming it is for you to speak spontaneously, but I had the honor of being with the mayor last night at the, uh, uh, what is it called, the Kyle? Kyle. The, the, what's the house? The Clay's. Clay's house. house, that's right, the Clay's <laughs> estate, and uh, gave a great presentation on that historic site. Mayor? Good morning, all. I know it's a little early, but I think this is one of my highlights, is certainly to celebrate our youth. And young people are the future of our communities. And if we are not supporting and guiding them along the journey, then we, as the adults, are missing the mark. And within my city of Framingham, we are dedicated to making sure that the youth in Framingham 
does have an opportunity to continue to grow. So we have established a youth council, but we've also established a 2030 council, which is for 21 to 35 year olds to help guide me on what we need to do in the city of Framingham to attract and retain young people. Our youth uh, council is also a part of our city government and organized in collaboration with the city council for 13 to 22 year olds. So we don't miss a gap in Framingham and making sure we're nurturing and lifting as we each climb. So thank you all and I'm glad you're here this morning, but more importantly, I'm glad that our youth is looking to lead and grow with us. Thank you. Okay, now, the sense of those formalities. Many of you have been to this for as many years as we've been having this program. And some of you are new. Certainly some of the students are new and some of the school's representative may be new. And I uh, just want to let you know, and I'm sure you'll hear this again and again maybe this morning, uh, that this whole program was initiated in Framingham back 27 years ago by John Garahan, after whom this breakfast is being named. He started an idea which has blossomed. He thought that at that time, much of the press was delivering, no due respect to the press, was delivering a lot of negativity about students, about the youth of today. And so he said, we ought to do something to reverse that. Let's recognize students who are really doing good in their schools, but perhaps don't get the recognition they deserve. And so at that time, he established this breakfast and he wanted it to be for the four schools that were represented in Framingham. At that time, Framingham North and South, the kids are too young to remember that one, and, uh, but many of you parents will remember, and Keefe Tech and Marion High School. And so he started with just four people, four students being recognized, and he gave each one of them a $500 scholarship towards whatever the university they would be attending. Then the committee got together and decided we ought to expand this. Let's go to the Metro West area. And it grew from four to what we have now is 15 different schools, uh, ranging all the way from Hopkinton to Natick to Dover uh, to Holliston. You'll see them all in your program. So we have done that. And again, thanks to the support of all of those sponsors who have continually tried to help us in helping those young people to be recognized. So it's a great day for us, it's a great day for the committee, it's a great day for the community, and the communities in which these students are going to school, because it is an honor to be with them today. So with that, I'd like to give one of our, our as some of you know, since I said it was John Garahan, and since that time, John Garahan had passed. But in passing, he also passed the torch onto his loving daughter a daughter I happened to have taught at Marion High School years ago. But she still looks like a teenager, but nevertheless, she is the, she's carried this program on and decided to carry on with the idea that her father had, the dream that his father, her father had, and she's done a great, great job in leading us down the, down the path to today. So with that, I'd like to invite Kathy Garahan to please come forward. Thank you, Bob. Good morning. For this 27th time, the Alliance for Metro West Unity welcomes student leaders in diversity, their families, friends, schools, area clergy, business and civic leaders, educational leaders, police and judicial representatives, community supporters, and others who choose to gather, reflect upon, and celebrate unity, inclusion, and the leadership that helps inspire these values. Since 1994, when we held the first event, we have met approximately 400 student leaders. These students are involved in activities that promote inclusion, fairness, fuller participation, and belonging for all members of the human family. They work against discrimination, 
exclusion, hate speech, isolation, and reduced opportunities that still occur due to race, religion, physical traits and abilities, intellectual abilities, mental health, age, gender, sexual orientation, family composition, and national or cultural heritage. Would the 2019 awardees of the Metro West Leadership and Diversity Award briefly stand so that we may welcome and thank you. Jordan, Natalia, Dale, Tillin, Mira, Ashani, Bobby, James, Alina, Sheila, Jenny, L, Michaela, Sylvia, and Carolyn. We congratulate you and wish you all the best as you complete your high school journey and move on to college, work, and your adult lives. Your schools and communities are already transformed because of you. You go to different Metro West schools, but you are among kindred spirits. Among today, others who also lead in how to treat others with respect. We are grateful for your leadership. Thank you. When you read the students' bios in your program books, and hopefully have a moment to speak with them directly, you will find a range of the ways these emerging leaders make the world safe for human difference, more fair, and more welcoming. The work of these young people is what will change our world. Some examples of their leadership include Jordan, Dale, Bobby, Sheila, and James's work through Best Buddies, Special Olympics, and other inclusive sports programs, which result in fuller participation and increased quality of school and community life for persons with disabilities, as well as true and life-altering friendships. Jordan and Natalie's creation of performance-based opportunities for inclusion through music and art and drama. Ashani, Tillin, Carolyn, and Sheila's work with younger students modeling leadership and hope. Mira, Tillin, Al, and Alina's use of their personal experience and perspective to increase awareness and encourage societal mindset changes. Al and Alina's reminder that words and labels matter. Michaela, Sylvia, and Jenny's leadership among underrepresented affinity groups at their schools where they lead difficult conversations on equality and provide a voice for inclusion work on student-led initiatives and increase participation for all students, and Ellen Ashani's leadership in working with our legislators on a more, and more just and inclusive world. If you will indulge me in a couple personal notes, my father would find me remiss if I did not mention for the first time in 27 years, one of the, one of the honorees is related to the Garahans. It was a very moving and, and source of great pride to read the name of my cousin's nephew, Bobby McGuire, on Hopkinton High's list this year. Bobby, we're very proud of you, and I hope I didn't just embarrass you. <laughs> I will also mention that my aunt, Mary Knoll sister, Katie Erisman, who lived in Framingham as a little girl and spent most of her fascinating career working in East Africa, is able to be with us today. So glad you are here with us, Aunt Katie. This year, Marlboro High School participates in this program for the first time. Welcome, Marlboro. Sheila, that means that you have the extra honor today and forever of being the very first winner of the Metro West Leadership and Diversity Award from Marlboro High. Congratulations, Sheila. We seem to be reminded again and again of why programs like this are still needed in what we think of as an advanced and an enlightened age in a society that has the benefit of many civil rights laws. 
We are shocked by incidents of violence in our schools and religious institutions and are aware that even in our own fine schools and communities, there have been incidents of hate, including very recently in this past year. For an example of how one of our young leaders channeled his reactions using his personal strength and interpersonal skills to help his school community work through response, healing, and understanding, change, and hope. When members of its community experience were targeted by hate, I direct you to Tillin's biography. Also, in Myra's biography, you will find a similar theme when she led teachers in a professional development event communicating the experience of African American students in those students' classes. Our awardees are indeed leaders. It occurs to me that much of what they do can be classified as diplomacy and advocacy. In that vein, our guest speaker seems a perfect fit as a role model for our awardees when they think about their next steps in life. To our awardees, we look forward to the ways you will change Metro West and the world as you become college students and adults. We commend you for your hearts, your ability to inspire others, to treat others the way people should be treated. We appreciate you for your determination to build a community without prejudice and with inclusion, equality, and respect. You have begun life-defining roles as people who use their gifts and energy to create a better future. We congratulate the schools, parents, and families for all you have done to nurture and develop these leaders. Would the parents and guardians, teachers, and school representatives of our Leaders in Diversity awardees please stand so that we may as a group applaud you. Thank you, parents and teachers. John Garahan is very much here with us in spirit, as are our very beloved other founding members who are no longer with us. We know that if they were here today, they would be so delighted to arrive at this 27th annual milestone. In honor of those who charted out this unique organization and all that it values, and the work of all recognized, all who have been recognized over the years, we hope that you will each reach out and make connections this morning, join those who here today promote inclusion and diversity, and demand respect for all in this community. Thank you again for being here to share this morning. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. I taught her well. And also, when she pointed out that her relative receiving the award, I also taught his mother. Makes me nervous. I am getting old, Mr. President, <laughs> right, from the university. So with that, uh, I'd like to invite up uh, Betsy Soule uh, to present the Nancy King Award. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Betsy Soule, and I'm the executive director at Metro West Legal Services here in Framingham. And this morning, I'm pleased to present the 2019 Nancy King Award to Out Metro West. The Nancy King Award was established in 2009 in memory of one of the original members of the Metro West Community Prayer Breakfast Steering Committee. Nancy served as the Executive Director of Metro West Legal Services for 31 years until her passing in 2007. Nancy embodied the values of the Alliance for Metro West Unity, this breakfast, and all the students being honored here today. She dedicated her professional life to equal access to justice for those unable to pay for it. Now, to tell you about our honoree, Out Metro West. Out Metro West began running youth programs in 2011 as part of the Unitarian Universalist Church in Wellesley. Its first program, called WAGLEY, was created in response to requests from local youth and their families who sought a safe place for LGBTQ high schoolers in Metro West. 
Wagley provided weekly social, educational, and supportive meetings and quickly drew dozens of area youth. In 2012, Out Metro West launched its second program, Umbrella, a twice monthly program for transgender and gender non-conforming high school students offering social interaction, education, and support. In 2014, with the demand growing and them outgrowing their space in Wellesley, Out Metro West became an independent nonprofit settling in Framingham but providing programming in various Metro West locations. In 2015, Out Metro West launched Nexus, the state's first program for LGBTQ and allied middle schoolers. Nexus provides a safe place for middle schoolers to explore questions relating to sexual orientation and gender identity and to provide check-ins, group discussions, and other activities. They also offer weekly drop-in hours where youth can participate in activities such as arts, crafts, games, and just spending time with friends in a less structured alternative setting. As this breakfast and the Nancy King Award celebrate and honor diversity, Out Metro West's values perfectly align with this goal. Their values include affirming LGBTQ identities through positive role modeling, challenging systems of oppression, creating supportive spaces for LGBTQ youth where they can be themselves, respecting, embracing, and celebrating diversity, and treating people with care and compassion. In eight short years, Out Metro West identified a need, responded to that need, expanded its ability to meet the need, and is providing support, education, and community for the LGBTQ youth in Metro West. In 2018 alone, Out Metro West served over 300 youth. Testimonials from their participants personalize the impact that Out Metro West has had on their lives, and they are clearly a very fitting and wonderful recipient for this award. So at this point in time, I would like to call up Out Metro West's Executive Director, Sawyer Bethel, to accept the award. Good morning. Uh, just want to first say thank you to the committee uh, for this award. It was really an honor to be able to receive this. Um, but most of all, thank you to the Metro West community and really for our queer young people um, who are my inspiration for the work that I do. Um, and it's an honor to work with and for them. Um, and that's why we're here. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Betsy, we give you Nancy's award. Oh, yeah, and I remember serving with, with Nancy, and an unbelievable woman, and uh, had great strides. And when it came to considering this award to be given to in her behalf, uh, it, it was certainly a, the whole committee couldn't help but think that uh, no greater person could be recognized by the committee. So we thank her. And uh, Betsy, thank you for the fine delivery. Uh, also, as I looked over at, at Betsy's table, I did not teach her, just in case you want to know, but she's sitting at a table with Stephen Trask, who happens to be the chief of police, and yes, I did teach him. I'm in trouble all over. And this place is filled with lawyers, too, just in case I need you after. Uh, at any rate, so I want to thank you all so far. Uh, we've got a lot to get through today, and I'd like to ask Kathy if she wouldn't mind coming back up again to introduce our keynote speaker. I have the honor of not just introducing to you a fantastic speaker and accomplished diplomat, but to share with you my dear friend. Your programs tell you all about Ambassador Harry Thomas and his stunningly accomplished career and give you an idea of all that he has witnessed and experienced. He served our country as a foreign officer in Foreign Service Officer in Indi India, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Peru, 
and later served as U.S. Ambassador to Bangladesh, the Philippines, and, and Zimbabwe. He was Executive Secretary of the Department of State, Director General of the Foreign Service, Director of State Department Operations Center, Special Assistant to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, and Director for Southeast Asia to the National Security Council. He is multilingual, and I will add that he is also a great golfer. He retired from the Foreign Service and now serves as a Kissinger Senior Fellow at the Jackson Institute at Yale University as Board Chairperson for Winter for Kids, Board Member for Care for the Homeless, and Trustee at the College of the Holy Cross. I want to mention that Harry and I were classmates at Holy Cross, along with a few other classmates who were here with us this morning. We became friends when we were just a year or two older than you awardees are now. After college, Harry and I also went off to the same university for graduate school in New York, where we share all the memories of the excitement of our 20s as the future began to unfold for us. Harry next went off to his fabled career in the United States Foreign Service. But true to his character, he never left his friendships. He just added to them and deepened them. I came back to Metro West while he went to Peru and then to Africa. His daughter Casey took her first steps in Zimbabwe while my daughter Caroline took her first steps here in Framingham. But Harry is one of those people with such dedication to his relationships. So he was always just a letter or a call away and eventually just an email or a text away he supported me in my personal and professional life from across the globe, always giving me practical and wise advice and support as true friends do. His global point of view, exposure to so many people and cultures, and his approaches in bridging differences between people made a big impression on me. His friendship and genuine interest in inclusion and development of leaders in society contribute to, to his getting to know this program, and year after year, sending donations, taking the time to read the student biographies, watch the videos, learn about the awardees, and give me feedback. In that process, he has gotten to know and care about Metro West from afar. And now I could not be more thrilled that he is here and I can share him with our community. I've introduced Harry to you, and now I want to introduce Harry to Metro West. So please, Metro West, welcome Ambassador Harry K. Thomas. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias, magadangu maga, namaste, zao shong hao, assalamu alaikum. Her Honor Mayor Yvonne Spicer, my high school, <laughs> former state representative Tom San Encandro and his life partner Marianne, ladies and gentlemen, we are family in the global village. We must take care of the village. Dale, you can and must take care of our village. I have seen much of the global village, and I am confident that working with such young leaders as Sylvia, we can improve and save it. We must maintain America's values of democracy, human rights, and economic freedom. But we can only achieve this if we listen and learn from each other. Thanks so much for inviting me to the Metro West Community Pair Breakfast. Sister Katie, it is an honor to be in your presence again. I have long admired the work, the bravery, sacrifice, and piety of the Mary Knowles. Kathy, thanks for that introduction. It wasn't necessary, but it was appreciated. Uh, Kathy kindly neglected to mention that I am a fan of all New York sports teams. <laughs> but please do not tell my hometown that Sweet Caroline is one of my favorite songs. <laughs> I confess that I accepted today's invitation because of my admiration 
for Judge Garahan's vision and because I am always eager to interact with our nation's future, the youth represented here today. And thank you for your service, Judge Harrington. A favor, just a favor. Please join me in wishing my mom, who turns 94 tomorrow, happy birthday. Uh, I'm going to catch a plane to visit her right after this. So I'd appreciate if everybody would say happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you so much. Without mom, I'm not here. <clears throat> As Kathy said, my life's honor was to be a Foreign Service officer. It enhanced my love of our nation's unique experiment in democracy. It allowed me to admire our global citizens. It often humbled me. I retired with gratitude for all those who taught me life's lessons, from the villager in Peru to the Mars lunar robotic designer in Zimbabwe who immigrated to America. That said, I have my greatest respect for those who adopted our nation and immigrated, no matter how they arrived on our American land. So if you ever had a chance to attend a naturalization ceremony, please do. It will bring tears to your eyes. I'm going to tell you about a couple of friends of mine. The lady in white, Chrisetta Comerford. She had to come to America when she was 21, dropping out of last year in college to make sure she made it uh, under our immigration rules. She landed in Chicago, got a job washing lettuce. She didn't know what lettuce was. Fifteen years later, Mrs. Bush hired her to be the exist assistant executive chef at the White House, where she remains today as the executive chef. These are some women that we worked with to stem domestic violence. When you're ambassador to the Philippines, you're the only ambassador in the world that has two residences. And that residence, that room, is where World War II ended. Not on the Missouri, in that room, is where the Japanese signed their final surrender. Uh, surrender. And you can see the, the photograph there. <clears throat> Christmas in Philippines is a great thing, and this is Apple Day App. I don't know if the youngsters know Apple Day App, remember, but he's a member of a singing group called the Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> he was born, he wears those glasses because he's going blind, but he was born to an American father whom he never met, and uh, Filipina. Uh, but he got a Pearl S. Buck scholarship to go to high school here. And he met Will I Am, and the rest is history. But he can't bring his mother to the United States because she's no longer his mother. An American family adopted him. Remember, under our laws, if you're adopted, your mom is no longer your mom. It's just one of these quirks of immigration. Now, he takes very well care of her, but she wanted to move here as did his sister. So, when you think about immigration, remember some of these quirks in our law. Ashani, I never imagined meeting Nelson Mandela three times, working at the White House on 9-11, or posing with the great Manny Pacquiao. Clearly, that was a few pounds ago. Uh, but I had to carry a Marine gunnery sergeant 100 meters. I have been truly blessed as you are, Bobby. And that is why I challenge you to study languages, to place no limits on yourself, James, and to listen. Our government has taught me languages, including Hindi. Thailand, where are you? You speak some Hindi, don't you? Oh, yes, you do. Everybody in here speaks some Hindi. Pajama. 
chimney, jungle, polo, and my fave that all of you know, chai, right? So when you're asking for chai tea, you're asking for tea tea, right? Um, Tylen, you know a wee bit of Tagalog. Yo-yo. Boondocks. Or my favorite from Malaysia, orangutan. It means the land of the orangs. Tan, land, right? Pakistan, land of the pure. Uzbekistan, land of the Uzbeks. The British got it really wrong. They were looking, not listening. That said, moving to a new land is fraught with peril. Yujing and Alina, how challenging is it to immigrate to a country whose people think that General Tsao's chicken and chow mein represent Chinese cuisine? <laughs> but seriously, congratulations to the students who are leading others and helping our community and the larger world by becoming more inclusive, by marking X if we choose to do L. The question we have for you, Jordan, is what will you do in the coming years? Or better yet, Carolyn, who is also an ambassador, what will you do with your Nimbus 2000 broomstick? I just love the focus of Harry Potter and his focus on children. What you do, Natalia, must be your choice. But I continue to hope that you find ways to help those that humanity has forgotten. As I travel, the stark inequalities that plague our global community are never far from my mind. I wonder what blessed me to be here and not panhandling in the Harlem of my youth. Every day I thank God and my parents, as I'm sure you do, Sheila, for helping me have an opportunity to help others. During my career, I was proud that our government, as well as our friends from Holy Cross, especially Kathy Garahan, were able to assist the less fortunate. In Bangladesh, they built a school. In the Philippines, over 4,000 women were dying each year in childbirth. Thousands of children were growing up without a mother's care. The solution was simple. Provide syringes with medication. Saving our children is an imperative, isn't it, Mira? We campaign to get rid of the R word and work with corporate America to fund the Special Olympics. We taught baseball to kids who scrambled up a garbage heap for food. We also raised funds to establish a safe house for women who were domestic abuse victims, and that was that picture that I showed you earlier. In Zimbabwe, friends and family sent books to establish a theater library and purchased sanitary napkins for women. We held the first ever LGBTQIA and non-binary community reception, but it had to be celebrated behind the walls because the attitudes in Africa are what we had years ago. And we fought human trafficking everywhere. The more slavery we uncovered, the more we found. And then we came home to America to find human slavery and human trafficking here. I say this to you to help you better, better understand the depth and breadth of our government's bipartisan commitment to assisting our global village, but also how generous our friends, schoolmates, and the American people are. Now let's turn to Zimbabwe, the home of Victoria Falls, one of the eight wonders of the world, the country in southern Africa where, believe it or not, it snows, where every winter's day morning there's frost on the ground. Zimbabwe boasts of six Rhodes Scholars in the past three years. It is a beautiful and tragic land. But let me stress why listening is critical. Let's go back to November 2017. And Robert Mugabe, trained by the Marist, Sister Katie, but advised by the Jesuits, 94-year-old president had ruled for 34 years. 
He maintained power through intimidation, assassination, and guile. He was a gifted orator. He defied and insulted American presidents, and in a peek over gay weddings, threatened to ask Obama for his hand in marriage. Mugabe is corrupt, mismanaged the economy, and admitted that his government could not account for $15 billion. He was also positioning Grace, his 52-year-old wife, to succeed him. And why not? Grace earned a doctorate from the University of Zimbabwe in three months. <laughs> Clearly, this 90-day wonder was brilliant. Let's pause for a second. November 4th, 2017, let's see if I can go. I was playing golf as I did every Saturday morning with my usual threesome, a 78-year-old colored man, as mulattoes are called there, named Foxy Klassen and Jiten Shah, an Indian Zimbabwean who had studied at Butler University. On the seventh hole, Foxy told me that a coup would soon take place and the Mugabe would be overthrown. I said, no way. After all, no country in Southern Africa had ever experienced a coup. Civilian rule, however flawed, was the norm. I wasn't listening, was I, McKellar? On November 6, my wife, Mitty, and I were heading to the Eastern Highlands, near Mozambique, again, to play golf. Got a text from Hopewell, a Harvard-educated journalist and my cigar and single malt buddy. He texted me that Vice President Munangagwa, nicknamed the Crocodile, for his terrible misdeeds was about to be fired. Later that day, the crocodile was sacked. You have to have friends in and outside an embassy. The next morning, we played golf. Mitty and I had been to this course only once before, a year ago. We were given the same two old caddies, old clothes full of holes, and they told me that the crocodile was nearby and trying to escape. I wondered, who were these caddies really? What were their real jobs? Never found out, but I don't think they were just caddies. Nevertheless, they were correct. The crocodile escaped. And I feared that Mugabe would learn that I was nearby and blame we Americans. But he was too busy trying to survive. A few days later, it was November 11th, it was Veterans Day which is a great day because it's also the day we celebrate the Marine Ball. The biggest party in every American embassy, we put on our tux, the Marines have on their blues, our wives have dieted for months. <laughs> it was going to be my last ever ball, and I was excited. My sister and brother-in-law were visiting. I had dragooned my brother-in-law into joining the group singing our national anthem and I was waiting for my gift from the Marines, because as an ambassador, you always get a gift from the Marines. And I was hoping for single malt or cigars. <laughs> but the party was interrupted. My coworkers called me aside, and they told me there was going to be a coup. Foxy was right. I was wrong. On November 12th, I telephoned the State Department, and I told them, to prepare for a military intervention. Not a coup, Bobby. Why? Because a coup mandates that we cut off assistance. And there was no way we wanted to cut off the $253 million we successfully spent on HIV AIDS every year. So therefore, we had to come up with a term. We call it military intervention and a new dispensation to describe the situation. You always have to come up with adjectives in diplomacy to say what you really mean and hide what you're trying to do. Um, now, November 18th, the first ever multiracial and multireligious protest took place in Zimbabwe. 
you can see the people on the buses coming into town, and they're waving the flag, which was illegal to fly your own flag because it was seen as protest. You see, everybody's flying their flag. And the Zimbabweans marched past our embassy. The Russian embassy is right next door. So do you, do you, any of you students know what they was chanting? The Russian embassy is next door. Can you see? Can you hear? What are these Africans chanting? But I think we could all figure out they were chanting USA, USA. I was in tears. Why not China? Why not Russia? Because the US government supported democracy, human rights, and good governance. When we do, we are celebrated. When we don't, we are cursed. So within a week, Mugabe resigned. The nation rejoiced. Unfortunately, you can see that this young woman's prayers did not, were not answered because the crocodile took over. And the crocodile, as after six months after I left, he was running for election and he put out this statement having me, he said I endorsed him. Of course, this fake news even in Zimbabwe. <laughs> I had not and I would not, but people thought I, I did. Uh, I was on CNN just telling people to vote for the candidate of their choice, but that is not what was reported. So I hope, students, you've learned the importance of listening. Because I departed Zimbabwe once again convinced of the importance of people's rights to self-determination, the limits of American power to right all wrongs, and the importance of listening to all voices, Bobby. Metro West students, I don't know what you're going to do with your Nimbus 2000, but wherever you go, take time to listen, to learn the culture and language, and do so with humility and humor. And please heed the words of the great philosopher Albus Dumbledore who famously said, it takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to your enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends, be they Representative Omar or Stephen Miller. And recall Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, who exhorted us to oppose those who spread distrust, engender superstition, and encourage disunity. Mazel tov. Thank you. Ambassador? Yeah. Kathy, would you like to come forward also? Kathy? On behalf of the Alliance for Metro West Unity, this is a certificate of appreciation presented to U.S. Ambassador Harry J. K. Thomas, Jr. in recognition of your invaluable contribution and insights as keynote speaker at the 27th Annual John P. Garahan Community Prayer Breakfast, Sheraton Framingham Hotel, Framingham, Mass., May 3rd, 2019. Thank, Thank you. you. I really like your talk. <laughs> Thank you very much for those powerful words and a great slide presentation. I did get to watch it from up here, though I couldn't see the big screen. I was watching. Now it is the time that you people are ready for, huh? 
But I would like to ask the following people to come to the dais. That is the Honorable Michael Fabry, First Justice, Marlborough District Court. Uh, Dr. Loretta Holloway, University Vice President for Enrollment and Student Development, Framingham State University. And Stephen Trask, Chief of Police, Framingham Police Department. Now, as you know, this is the time for the presentation of the awards. And uh, just, again, for the benefit of those who are not familiar with this, years ago, uh, the committee had decided, thanks to the gracious donations from all of you, whether it's the Lions Club or whether it's legal services or whether medical professions or private persons, uh, came with the idea to donate a plaque to each of the individual schools that were being recognized. And of course, by that time, there were many recipients who had already received the awards in the past history. But we went and backtracked and got their names and had the plaques developed with that name on it. This is what it looks like. This one of these plaques should be hanging up in each of the schools. And upon it is written all the names of the students who have received it in the various years. Some schools have gotten so many, uh, have been a part of this for the 27 years, we've had to get an additional plaque for them to add their names. And for the benefit of everyone, the Alliance for Metro West Unity Community Prayer Breakfast, Marlboro High School, this is for Marlboro, first time recipients, in recognition of your contribution toward making your school and community a place where there is greater communication and harmony for your efforts in promoting understanding between people of diverse backgrounds. This will be received by Marlboro, and each of the schools has one, but also, The students will receive a similar plaque of this nature, individualized student's name, again, talking about their work in diversity. And even though we're not political, politicians love to get their name out there. So the House and the Senate, this one here is from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts House of Representatives. Be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to the name of the individual student in recognition of being named the 2018 leader in diversity. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all your endeavor. Signed, Robert DeLeo, Speaker of the House, and Patrick Lewis, State Representative. And Representative over here, sorry, Danielle Gregorio. That, along with, I hope I'm not boring you all. You get this okay? All right, uh, this is from the State Senate, official citation. Similar to that, in recognition of being honored at the 27th Annual John P. Garahan Metro West Community Prayer Breakfast as a leader in diversity, and be it known, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Signed, of course, Carol Spilka, Michael Hurley, and James Eldridge on the May 3rd. And if that isn't enough, Framingham State University, the president is sitting right before me, and if I've forgotten this, you know, whew. Uh, nevertheless, Framingham State University, a number of years ago when uh, the president was uh, uh, Ms. Heidelman, and uh, she had offered to us the idea that maybe the students would be interested in attending Framingham State University. So with that, of course, the Board of Trustees, president, faculty, staff, and students extend congratulations to the individual student from the school, Framingham State University, Metro West Leadership and Diversity Scholarship recipient, in recognition of your outstanding leadership in fostering and promoting inclusiveness in school and community. Signed, there he is, Mr. President, all right, Cavallo, thank you. And so this will be given to each one of the students an opportunity uh, to attend Framingham State University at the president's expense. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say that? <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, but with that, that would they'll be receiving today. So without further ado, Judge Fabry, would you please come forward? Chief Trask is will be escorting the students into the hallway. Do you need a copy?
morning. Good morning, all. Thank you for being here. Uh, Judge David Cunis sends his regards. He was unable to make it. I was talking to Reverend Lloyd earlier. I think it's uh, his third year that last minute he uh, pegged me to fill in for him. So I'm planning on telling him next year he's going to ask me if he can come. Uh, <laughs> this, this is such a great event uh, for us, the judiciary, to participate in. And those of you who are lawyers who work in the judiciary uh, and law enforcement, other parts of our uh, justice system, whether it's a criminal or civil justice system, I'm sure you're all mindful of the fact that uh, people who come to court usually don't come there willingly. So we often see those who are either facing domestic violence, have substance abuse issues, alcohol issues, mental health, criminal justice matters. Uh, and we tend to forget uh, and begin to look at the world through the narrow lens of uh, we're seeing crises before us day after day. Um, for that reason, when I uh, began at Marlboro almost five years ago, I put a little sticker right in the middle of my bench to remind myself uh, that there's a lot of good out there in the world. And it simply says, remember that could be you standing out there. And I think that tends to give me a different uh, lens and compassion, at least for those who come before us. Uh, and some of the highlights of our day, at least my day, even though we see people who may not want to be in court and are there for uh, reasons often beyond their control, um, it is a joy uh, from time to time, in spite of some lawyers may not think so. But when I see somebody succeed on probation, uh, it is a, is a pleasure or an honor to know that we've somehow helped them uh, get beyond the difficulties that they're having. When I see somebody who has been facing domestic violence but then chooses uh, uh, to try to rebuild their life with their fellow partner, that is somewhat of a success uh, and we can view it as a success as well. So it really is a pleasure and an honor to be here, uh, to step away from my narrow lens of dealing with uh, one uh, difficult situation after another and to see uh, a, a group of uh, incredibly talented and able young students um, who have uh, done so much with their lives. And we, uh, we hear their, the activities, the various activities and things that the programs they've done, but we've got to keep in mind that they've done that while they've been students doing their homework, participating in their com community, many in sports and the like, uh, and is incredible. Uh, and an honor to be here uh, to uh, hand out these awards, but also it's comforting to know that we're passing our world on to students such as the students before us. So uh, congratulations to all of you. <laughs> Jordan Manousas from Algonquin Regional High School. Natalia Faraz of Ashland High School. <laughs> Dale McLaughlin of Assabet Valley Regional Technical High School. Mira, is it Mira or Myra? 
Mira Donaldson. Shani Kuruku Basharaya. Did I get that right? Second misstep. Okay. El Martinez of Natick High School. Jenny Tang, St. Mark's School. <laughs> Michaela Martin Mason from Walland Hill School for the Arts. Next recipient, unfortunately, couldn't be here, but uh, we're going to announce her uh, name in school. Sylvia Lagore from Wayland High School. And our last recipient, Carolyn McDermott from Westboro High School. Thank you very much for presenters for bringing those to, uh, to the students. I'd ask the students to come back up this way again, line up right behind me. Asked to write a speech for this event on what diversity means to me. At the time, I considered the prompt to be somewhat vague. 
See, my understanding of what the term diversity means has evolved over what I have come to consider my activism career. When I was in fourth grade, I started to understand the concept of difference. I remember the kids pointing out how my skin color was different than theirs and pulling on my then long curly hair. When it became a regular occurrence, I began to feel uncomfortable, understanding that it wasn't fun for me anymore. I began to associate that difference with fear. This trend continued as I began to understand how my multiracial family looked different than that of my almost exclusively white counterparts. I distinctly remember hearing reports of police brutality on the news and fearing for my father while he drove our car. He had dark skin just like all the other men who had been killed at the wheel. At that point in time, I hadn't been taught any reason to believe diversity was something to be valued. I didn't feel that I possessed any autonomy over my self-identity or my self-expression until the first year of high school. I came into an understanding and pride regarding my identity as a Latinx person and as a budding queer person. I joined groups like Interfem, a group for discussion on intersectional feminism, and GSA, an alliance for people of all genders and sexualities. Interfem provided me with a space that was not centered in whiteness, heteronormativity, or the confines of binary gender. For the first time, I was able to freely speak about my experiences as a queer person of color without the threat of white tears or accusations of reverse racism. I felt liberated from the tokenization that had molded the sharing of my experiences into education for the majority. These became my safe spaces. I would, and still do, spend hours after school enriching myself in conversations surrounding diversity. No longer as a negative term, but as an active noun. I began to own the diversity within myself, but it wasn't enough. I began to understand diversity and inclusion as an activity, not only a state of mind. I gathered all the media I could and began to learn about the ex my experience and those of other people. The works of Audre Lorde, Cleve Jones, Erica Hart, Kimberly Crenshaw, ta C. Coates, Malcolm X, Tara Huska, and more. I started to become more radicalized and willing to speak out in a variety of spaces learning to be unapologetic about my cause and how to navigate conflict. I've since become even more involved in my communities and learned more about myself in the process. I've attended rallies and walkouts, filed a bill and become active in our state government, assisted in formulating and administering trainings for my school district, served on national councils for nonprofits, and probably what I'm most proud of, becoming GSA president at Natick High School something that is not on a national level, but I still hold near and dear to my heart because it allows me to become a mentor for kids who felt just like me before I found myself. I've changed so much through my journey with diversity. I've come to value what I used to fear. I'm now El Martinez, a proud non-binary person of color, amongst other things, who has come to understand that true diversity means hard work, a hectic schedule, a strong sense of self, but most important of all, a compulsion to make the world a more equitable place, combined with the drive to remain vigilant and forever a learner. I speak on behalf of the honorees when I say that we are so grateful to the Alliance for Metro West Unity for recognizing our leadership and promoting diversity and inclusivity. Your support allows the movements and ideas put forth by young people to thrive. I also thank the friends, family, and teachers who have taken the time to gather on behalf of the honorees this morning. We are so happy that you could join us today. Thank you. And, and now from Hollison High School, Ashani. Hello and good morning, everyone. On behalf of all of the recipients of the John P. Garahan Leadership and Diversity Award, I would like to sincerely thank the Alliance for Metro West Unity. This is truly an honor, and we are all very humbled to be standing here before you today. For the past couple of years, I have been fascinated by the concept of disruptive innovation a term that was coined by Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen to describe a good or service that slashes existing competitors in the market because of its revolutionary characteristics. 
Take, for example, the invention of the automobile. When automobiles were first debuted in the late 19th century, they were luxury items that were reserved for the wealthy and only the wealthy. It was not until Henry Ford came along 30 years later and transformed the automobile landscape with the advent of the people's car, the Model T, a car that was accessible to almost anyone at the time. The Model T is just one example of a disruptive innovation. Google, the iPhone, portable computers, they are all disruptive innovations. So, what makes these innovations so powerful, so game-changing? What was so unique about these groundbreaking technologies? Was it serendipity, or rather was it creativity? To me, the answer seems to lie in the latter. The more I reflect, the more I recognize that creativity could, in fact, be the very engine of innovation. Innovation, ladies and gentlemen, results from the unique confluence of creative individuals with a common vision and purpose. This realization begs yet another question. What is the magic ingredient that unlocks the power of creative thinkers? What catalyzes and what cultivates creative thinking? After much reading and reflection, the conclusion I have reached is that diversity is the magic ingredient that spawns creativity. Diversity. It's the reason we have creativity. It's the reason we have innovation. Think about this for a second. Think about how America itself can be deemed a disruptive innovation. For over a century now, America has earned its rightful place as a powerhouse across multiple dimensions, including technology, education, and medicine. American pioneers are so world-renowned for their creativity and innovation. And why is this so? Perhaps it's because America is, as former President Jimmy Carter once put it, not a melting pot, but a beautiful mosaic with different people, different beliefs, different yearnings, different hopes, and different dreams. We live in one of the world's most diverse nations, and it is paramount that we take note of how our human trail mix has the potential for producing a future full of unparalleled ingenuity. More locally, over the past year at Holliston High School, I created the Global Health Society, a club with the goal of providing a welcoming platform for diverse students to share out ways for how we as a community can help tackle real-world problems in the field of global health. Through the club's weekly meetings, my goal is not only to encourage the development of out-of-box solutions, but also to promote the diversity of thought. Because I know that, that the diversity of thought is what we need going forward to ensure tomorrow full of great potential. So please, let us come together, each and every one of us. Let us set aside our differences and let us engineer the next great disruptive innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Ashani, and again, thank you, El. Uh, again, very powerful. Yeah. I'm not going to do it, Dan. They're taking bets. And I said I'd bite my tongue to try not to cry. But invariably, events like this, I did it at the reception. I say it again. What an incredible generation is coming forward. What an incredible. And Ashani, I didn't have a Model T Ford, just in case you thought I did. <laughs> but the reality is, yes, my thanks to these students, my thanks to their parents, their relatives, their friends who have encouraged them along life's path. We all, on behalf of the committee, wish you the greatest amount of success in the future and all your endeavors. You're doing a great, great job. And uh, thank you for sharing this morning with us. All right, with that, I'd ask Lonnie, please come again. I'd ask you to please stand for God Bless America followed by the closing benediction from Reverend Lloyd. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her 
through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, my home sweet home. What a great... What a great morning this has been. Let's give a round of applause for these here recipients. As you depart from this place, and each of you who we honor today, not only do we honor you, but we honor your families, we honor your schools. We recognize your hard work. We recognize your contributions that you have already made and you shall make in the future. We are far more richer a community, both locally, nationally, and globally, as our speaker has so mentioned. As you do so, I would charge you to wear two hats, at least. One is that you know full well from what you have done already that you are called to be agitators, that indeed, where you see injustice, where you see that which is not about building community, that you agitate. Indeed, in your agitation, you will be a part of bringing about change. Don't stop being an agitator. But at the same time, there are those moments in which you must be an ally as well. That indeed, you are not alone in what you do, and indeed, build allies, others of like-mindedness, those who, yes, recognize and encourage you that indeed we do work for unity, but we do so from perspective that we're not working for uniformity. Your creativity, your leadership, and indeed what you bring to us and inspire us, we're looking forward indeed for the future. Both hats, wear them. Do not allow anybody to somehow put you in a box where you can only wear one. Wear them both. And indeed, when you do, these in this room and even beyond this room will cheer you on as an agitator and come alongside you as an ally. May God's blessings be upon you both today and tomorrow. And everybody in the room said, Amen. Thank you for coming.